Good evening and welcome to the 313 Symposium once again with myself, Thomas Sheridan, and Jason Roba over there in the North Pacific Northwest of the USA. Tonight we have a man who's I've been dealing with for, gosh, maybe over a decade. It's practically family at this point. And there's a man whose radio station, a radio program, Legalized Freedom, is one of the benchmarks of alternative listening. It's absolutely an archive treasure trove of alternative thinking and very well done and put together over the last, it must be 12, 12 years you've been doing, 11, 12 years. And the certain people on there have just been delivered colossal interviews. There was an amazing one recently with uh, John, uh, John Waters, but I, I can remember once Rupert Sheldrake. And I've been on the show loads of times and uh, I always enjoy talking to this man. Greg Moffat. Now, the reason why I wanted Greg Moffat on the show is two things. He, he, he's a, a repository in many ways of all this knowledge that he's pulled in over the years on his program. So it'd be good for us, the listeners, to talk about various subjects. But also in recent months, he's been kind of coming out of the shadows and he's been making vlogs. And like so many of us during the, the Rona lockdown, there was a kind of a transformation that our own consciousness went on. And he came out first talking about the music business. Now, he was the keyboard player, Damien, in the metal goth <laughs> band uh, Cradle of Filth. And made two albums with him, two good albums as well. And uh, he left. The, he, was, he was kind of jumped into music and then jumped out again and worked as a music journalist. And then he did like, Legalize Freedom uh, after that. And uh, like I said, it's an enormous, enormous repository of information. If you haven't joined it and subscribed to the subscription, is an absolute bargain, considering what you get there on top of the regular free broadcasts. So welcome, Greg Moffat. I'm delighted to have you on here, and I hope you're well. Thanks, Thomas, for everything you've just said. I'm very grateful. And um, yeah, I feel like we've had a symbiotic uh, relationship with regards to uh, you know podcasting and whatnot over the years. Yeah. You've, you've given a lot to, to me personally through your writings, and uh, your, your broadcasting as well. And uh, if, if there's a day when you don't make uh, a video sitting in your car, I kind of feel like, oh, shit, he hasn't done one today. You know, I feel like something's missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the pressure. But uh, some days I have nothing to say. You know, you know how it is. But uh, nothing happens. First question, is human consciousness going through a spin cycle at the moment? <sighs> I feel like it is, but it also feels e easy to say like it is i mean I, you could say hasn't it always been doing that you know isn't that what isn't that what incarnating on this earth as a human is a spin cycle you know in consciousness and when i remember when two, the year 2000 was approaching um people were you know, there was all this millennial fear and uh, you know talk about you know what's going to happen and um i remember having read about what happened in the lead up to the year 1000 and there was the same kind of stuff and i thought well isn't this just a regular thing that happens you know we we always like to think of ourselves that we're living in a special time um and that clearly seems to be a thing that seems to be the case but um and when 9 11 happened i i certainly I mean 2012 was just a non-event but when 9-11 came around, I felt like that was an epochal event. You know, this was something that really, really significant in human history. Uh, but then that kind of, it kind of went away and it didn't. And, you know, the, 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 the waves from that still uh, rippled out. You know, we're still living with some of the um, uh, significance of 9-11 today. Now, uh, actually, you, you mentioned I'd done some uh, vlogs. My uh, vlog, as I prefer, uh, prefer to call it 9-11, uh, uh, sorry, COVID-9-11, a warning from history kind of addresses this. But everything we've been living through with the pandemic, and I, I apologize to those who are tired of this to go to that so soon, but everything we've been living with the last 18 months or so has really made it feel um, just as you say, um, spin cycle for human consciousness, something is happening and it isn't as to, to paraphrase John Waters, who mentioned my interview with him, to paraphrase him, it isn't just about a head cold. Something else is going on here. And I don't yet know what it is. I, like you, I'm still trying to figure it out. And you're actually at the, at the leading age, I think, of, of trying to reach for this, to grasp it, what it is. Yeah. 
It's a, it, I really don't know either. I, I fly all over the place every day of the week, but I do absolutely concur with yourself and Jason feels the same way too. Uh, John Waters also is that, yes, there's something else. And it's not just a great reset or anything like that because they could do that tomorrow if they wanted. The banks could, the bank, you know, the bank's well, and, you know, they have us well and truly by the short and curlies. They could do it tomorrow if they wanted, really wanted that. It's something more and it's something they're not able to control. And there are often times when I see glimpses of fear in their eyes or in their, their behavior, as if they're, they themselves are confused. Uh, perhaps like things like you doing all your work and interviewing the people you work and me and Jason and all the other people making films and all the things we do is probably the kind of, I don't know, the, the precursor for what's coming. We were almost like in boot camp. And, we're, we're, and I think that's why we're handling it better than others. You know, and I, although it's affecting us, of course, but do, do you do you feel that that you you know you spoke about when you were a teenager you went to see I know you, you grew up in Lima Valley right in Northern Ireland and you went to see uh, uh, Saxon at the band the heavy metal band Saxon at a festival in Derry or something like that and you said it was like one of those step into consciousness moments do you think that that was the beginning of where you are now in not just in terms of music but the kind of things you're interested in that you were awakened, like in that Jungian sense, you stepped into yourself. I don't know. It certainly was with music. For the rest of it, I, I don't think it was. Um, interestingly, um, you, you'll appreciate this, Thomas. I'm not sure if, if Jason will, but I actually uh, spent the first six or seven years of my life in Ballymena. That's where I actually uh, grew up oh. and then moved to Castle Rock um, in County Derry and then to Lima Valley. But... Uh, the local MP in, uh, this is not answering your question at all, but I don't care. Oh, go ahead. I know where this is going. I, is it, it's Ian Paisley, right? Oh, yeah. I think I probably told you about this. Never, never, never. <laughs> so we had we had him in our kitchen once for a cup of tea <laughs> um, in the 70s. But, um, but yeah, so not, not for um, uh, the subject of conscious, the awakening of consciousness, but certainly awakening to music. Yeah, that event was pivotal. That was my first concert, and I think everybody like like your first girlfriend, your first kiss, yeah. your first your first taste of alcohol, or you know, all these um, you know initiatory rites. Yeah. Uh, your first concert is very significant. So yeah, it was a uh, Templemore Sports Complex. To call it a sports complex is is really over egging it, you know. <laughs> it, but uh, it was in Derry. I don't. Even, you remember where I don't in the city it is or if it still exists. Um, but yeah, that was just the first time to hear live music. Um, maybe a year and a half after I decided that heavy metal was a thing for me. Um, yeah. to have uh, just the volume, you know, and I, I mentioned to you uh, in emails that I've still got some pain in my right ear if live music was over a certain decibel level because at that concert, the, the band had some pyro and uh, when it went bang i could feel it my right ear went bang and to this day it's it's a thing you know it doesn't trouble me much but if bands are too loud uh, which is a bit of a uh, you know oxymoron when you're talking about heavy metal if the bands are too loud then that, that the pain is um is still there but yeah that was a that was a threshold moment no doubt about it greg on on the the subject of firsts and everything i i wanted to go back and say too that when Thomas and I came onto your show back in, uh, I think it was May or, in May or June, that was my first time ever going on a radio show with someone. And I was shitting bricks for you know, a little bit of time, the days and weeks leading up to that. So nervous, like, shit, here I'm going on to, to Greg Moffat's show with Legalized Freedom with Thomas Sheridan, you know, the man Thomas Sheridan about a film we just made together. And that was one of those experiences where I'm like, well, this is starting to happen. And then from that, st Thomas and I started doing this uh, symposium together and I really got a real taste for liking doing these, uh, this type of interview with people coming on shows. And so it was just a real big inspiration to have done that show with you and then to have gone on with Thomas and start doing this together. And this first kind of thing, right? Uh, in May, March, April, May, I had no desire to ever go on to the internet in front of a camera and a microphone with Thomas and, and guests here and start doing this kind of thing. But growing up, I always really enjoyed uh, listening to Coast to Coast AM with uh, uh, with Art Bell, and then again with George Norrie and you know uh, your stuff and Red Ice Radio back in the day before they got weird and some of these <laughs> other shows. I, <laughs> yeah, I I always really enjoyed this. So now it's like I found this thing, and I just kind of wanted to. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
I know <laughs> it's <laughs> weird. They were they were good, you know, ten years ago, I'd say, but it was just yeah, shit got weird, and they uh, yeah, they had their Doctor Strange love moment. <laughs> but uh, uh, so with that, I, I wanted to thank you for that, and then just kind of ask you a question too. It's like uh, you're you're such a good uh, speaker, and you know, I find myself tripping over my own words in these interviews and writing out here in my my little spiral journal before the shows. Uh, my notes and stuff and then forgetting all of that what what do you do greg for or what did you do in the beginning for preparation if you've got you know a guest like thomas or someone on your show do you do you uh go through and read uh some of their material a week out or a month out or are you are you at the point now where you you can just draw from your own experience and sit down uh you know and be prepared to to go on air i just kind of wanted to ask you about your uh, your process if that's cool well Natural gobshites like me and Thomas can just go, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just, you know, wind us up and let us go. But, you know, yeah, of course you do serious preparation, uh, but you try to make it look like you haven't or sound like you haven't. That's, that's kind of the trick, you know. Um, I've, I've done some production work. Uh, this is, I know David Icke is a super controversial subject, but... Um, when he did the, that people's voice thing, which you, you may not be aware of, Jason, but uh, Thomas will remember. And there's, that was very problematic. But I did some sort of green room production stuff there with his son, Gareth. Basically, he was uh, doing presenting and I, I was making sure he knew everything he needed to know before he went on air. So there's that kind of process. You know, you've got, you, you want to go on whatever your medium is, radio, television, you want to uh, go on there. It looks um, like you know what you're talking about, but without having made too much effort. So effortless, you know. So, and I, my stuff isn't live. You know, legalized freedom stuff's pre-recorded. So I have maximum respect for people who go on live radio and television, even you know mainstream media, media shills who go on you know on the BBC or whatever. If they can go on there and and uh, make it look slick, you know that's a, that's a talent in itself. But yeah, a lot of it, effort goes in before I open my mouth, you know, and with, with Thomas, for example, the very first interview I had with him around um, uh, his second book, um, I, I read the whole thing and made copious notes and had talking points uh, arranged beforehand, just so that I didn't, my mind didn't go blank, basically, you know, so uh, I appreciate the journey that you're on, Jason, you know, and uh, it, it gets easier. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think also your brain becomes like a big sponge and your conversational skills become better in terms of dealing with guests. That's what I discovered anyway. You've always got like, you've got anecdotes that you can, if the, if the conversation starts drying up, you've got anecdotes from your past experience that jumps, you, you can jump that in and suddenly pop it into the conversation. Now, I know you then, after your, your heavy metal indu indu indoctrination, you started a fanzine, a metal fanzine. You, you went to England to go to do university or college and then you worked in the, the music industry proper as a journalist right is that right or did you go to a band first no no uh, you're you got it correct um i i did i you know, i did the fanzine because i was so enthusiastic about music yeah. and this this is why the legalized freedom thing started i was really passionate about something i wanted to tell other people about it so i, I did some kind of media thing so other people could access it so yeah i went to university and um then I'd already start, I'd started doing a few articles, uh, music biz articles for money. And then when I finished university, I went into that um, full time, then became a professional musician for three years and then went back to the professional uh, music writing thing for a long time. And that's, so, only, that's only recently ended, actually. For everybody, if you'd like writing in general is, is gone. You know, it's like I... I I'll constantly think about writing another book, but the, the amount of effort I'll put into it, I, I won't get anything back. Just that no one buys books anymore, you know, even Kindle. So it's like, it, it's better. I think it's, it's much more rewarding and immediate with the video thing now. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a story of our time. So who are you writing for? Like Metal Hammer and Kerrang and things like that? I've written for all the biggies, Metal Hammer, Kerrang, um, classic rock, prog. Um, which is a magazine that's still going, doing very well, actually. And I've written for magazines overseas, you know, it's like syndicated stuff. Uh, Terrorizer magazine was my baby. That's um, no longer a thing. But um, I was deputy, ed deputy editor there for 10 years. 
And um, that was that, you know, that was my full time thing. I was really passionate about that magazine because it was uh, so um, across the board, you know, so uh, open minded and broad. Uh, compared right. compared it wasn't just metal it was extreme music you know so you'd have a band like one of my favorite bands of all time swans you know we, we'd have them I'm, I'm a big fan of swans yeah yeah we, we'd, have, we'd have them or we could have like you know einstein and neubauten um it was just industrial stuff and uh, uh some hard electronic stuff you know we just encompass a little bit more than a regular magazine well kerrang kerrang open became more open-minded after a while i remember seeing they started to sneak bands like Skinny Puppy and, and bands like that in. So they, they sort of like became less metal as well. I think the metal thing broadened anyway, you know, it came into a bigger thing. Yeah. So, you know, the Cradle of Filth thing, this is an interesting thing. You, I just find it so interesting that, you, okay, you've got the dream that so many people want to, to join a rock band that had already been established. You were touring the world. as a, You had a small time as a rock star and you made two albums and they're probably their two best albums as well. And um, then you just left like that's that to me is a fascinating story that, that I don't think you've ever really spoken about. I haven't heard it anyway, like in and out of Cradle of Filth. How did that happen? Well, I have spoken about it, actually, because um, a few uh, people who've done um, you know, who are doing the, the equivalent of what you do and the equivalent of what I do with Legalized Freedom, they're doing with like metal. Uh, you know, podcast series have interviewed me, done historical interviews. Um, but and uh, I, when this eventually gets published, I'll, I'll link to the interviews uh, in the comments if people are interested. But um, as far as leaving Cradle of Filth goes, I was how shall I put it? I was invited to leave. <laughs> it was one of those situations. Um, but joining it was uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's not something I ever made any effort to do and that might sound you know, like slightly annoying to some people you know because some people go through most of their lives striving to be a success in rock and roll you know they want to be in a band that that releases an album that people take notice of and maybe they like to make a living living doing it and almost no one ever gets to do that and i kind of fell into it almost by accident but you know it, it is what it is um it was not long after i left university um, well, about a year after that, so it was 1995, and um, I was uh, I bought a, co a copy of uh, the latest issue of Metal Hammer magazine, which was a big thing here in the UK. There's various editions published around the world, in you know, Spain and Australia, but this was the British edition. And uh, I was sat in the living where I do now, and I was sat on the fountain in the, in the city centre, and it was a nice warm summer day and I read the whole thing right through the classifieds and in the classifieds uh, there was this little ad that said name band you know so for those who don't know that means a band who are established uh, require keyboard player and a few years earlier I'd started playing keyboards uh, inspired by um, my love of 1970s synth music like uh, Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schultz, stuff like that and uh, uh, yeah Jason gets this you know you check out Jason's work um, You'll let me see why we've got this in common. And for some reason, I thought I'm going to apply for that. It was just like, why? But I didn't have anything particularly going on at, at that time. Um, I was kind of, uh, I say, I just left university. I had enough money in the bank to not need a job. And uh, so I wrote a letter, as we did back then, and put a cassette <laughs> into the uh, package with me noodling on keyboards, sent it off, and I got a reply about a week later saying, uh, come down to Suffolk, which is where the band were based. And uh, yeah, we'd like you to, to try out. And um, I did that. Uh, came back up north. And uh, a few days later, I got a phone call saying, you're in. So that must have been amazing, really. You know, now you're a rock star. You know, out of nowhere, you know, it must have been incredible. It, well, I didn't, didn't really think about it in those terms, but that's effectively what it was. And it was just, it was a, it was a hell of a ride. You know, there was, there was a certain amount of unpleasantness and ugliness and the, the, the band was riven by arguments and division. All, I mean, it's probably still is, but all the way through that time. But I, I look back on it so fondly because it was just like, like uh, jumping at like a hyperspace, jumping into another reality just for three years 
of like stuff that most people it's the stuff that 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 fiction is made of you know like films like and then bear in mind this is relatively small scale you know we were we were uh we got to the point after about a year i was in the band we got to the point where we earned a full-time living from it but it wasn't you know we weren't making millions or anything like that but it was still all the cliches all the glorious cliches were there you know that uh drugs and, and groupies and like uh, everything, uh, all those things in Spinal Tap, this is Spinal Tap, the film, that all started to make sense. Is that, how, you know, I was ticking them all off <laughs> week yeah. after week, you know, like getting lost backstage, you know. <laughs> but it was, I'm sure it was, it was a phenomenal experience, even with the bad, the, let, the bad taste that left in your mouth. Yeah, the, from an artistic point of view, um, I have regret around it because... The, the, the music that was made at that time, I, I, you know, was some of it was so transcendent and um, fans to this day just say, oh, my God, you know, this, this has really just changed my life. And I just wish that there could have been more of that. And I wish that there didn't have to be the infighting and bickering and uh, small mindedness and that we could have realized that that we were part of something bigger. But um, I was the oldest person in the band at that time. You know, so everybody's in their early to mid 20s. And I, I guess, you know, everybody who was part of that has learned from life since then. But uh, uh, being part of that, I, I just wish there could have been more of it. There was so much potential. And the band is still going today successfully. Yeah. But um, I would like to continue to create um, on that level um, if it had been possible. But, you know, it clearly wasn't meant to be. And you never thought about joining another band or starting a band afterwards or anything like that? There, there was actually, I almost joined another metal band called My Dying Bride. And that was actually much more my thing musically, despite what I just said. I mean, the music I made with, with Cradle was like, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, but this, this metal band from Yorkshire, um, who again are still going to this day, they at one point, it was 1999, they were uh, coming back from, uh, some difficulties, they, difficulties they'd had and they were looking for a keyboard player and I went over and, and had a dialogue with them about joining. That didn't happen, obviously, but it nearly happened and uh, that would have been uh, possibly an even more productive phase of music for me if, if, if that had gone ahead because I absolutely love their music. It just really sits with me um, really well. Their, their music touches me at a very deep level. And uh, but the guys in the band are just I I I know them quite well and get on very well with, and uh, you know they've got that Yorkshire sense of humour yeah. sort of thing really, really dry, and uh, so yeah that almost happened but it didn't. So back into music journalism, and then I'm assuming that went along like a, a good job, and then nine was it nine eleven that you something changed? Just the, was that was it a, a a major moment or something and switching it towards all towards alternative things. Yeah. I mean, it took a while for it to kick in, but like, I think for a lot of people, nine 11 was a, a, a consciousness shift. Yeah. Um, you know, we're trying to process what had happened and what it meant and what was really behind it. And um, I think it was probably, it, it was 2011 by the time I started legalized freedom. So it took a few years, but certainly 9-11 had me thinking about what, what am I doing with my life? You know, and I think a lot of people are finding that now with the, uh, the yeah. pandemic, you know, yeah. you know, what, what are my priorities? What do I want to achieve while I'm alive? And um, so, yeah, 9-11 was definitely a trigger. It was more like a slap around the face, you know, like a wake up moment. Um, it's not like I was asleep beforehand, but it was it kind of stepped it up a little bit because right going right back to the 80s i was reading um i've been on the the journey that i'm still on started back then reading uh, you know uh, occult and esoteric material um you know arthur c clark um you know his strange world sort of tv shows i was interested in everything that everything 14 you know the the the, the group that we have uh beyond room 313 all of that stuff uh, kicked in um, in my early teens. I'd already been there when I was a child. I was obsessed with like dinosaurs as a lot of little boys are. And uh, 
So, but that was a, a kind of a, a metaphor for what, what, hap what happened in the past, all that, that time beyond, uh, you know, like Graham Hancock stuff that, that, that we can't see, that we don't know what happened. What happened? You know, where did we come from? Why are we here? You know, what, where did humans really, are we really from the apes? You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, so I would say that 9-11 began a process that uh, culminated in 2011, where I thought I've got to do something about this. Because I remember my girlfriend at the time, I was reading all these very interesting books, um, including stuff, you know, by Graham Hancock. And I, I was going into her workshop where she was doing her crafts and sort of saying, oh, wow, you know, I've just been reading about this. And at some point she said, this is very interesting and I like hearing about it, but why don't you put it out there, you know? And that's why I thought, okay, I'll start a blog. And then I realized that although I'm a writer, I actually find the writing process quite difficult, you know? I, I like when the writing's done, but I don't like doing it. So hence, I thought, well, just do what you're doing with your poor girlfriend, just talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, go ahead, Jason. Oh, I was going to say, just isn't it so interesting too? Like we went from the talking about music into, you know, your career in music and then uh, going into 9-11. I just always find it so fascinating that so many of us in this field started off or began with music and these topics just being there from our childhood or, you know, our adolescent years. And it just, it's just kind of like Thomas, we're talking about the path of the bard. It's like, you know, there, there's these different, uh, uh, different pillars that we rest on. And, you know, one of one of the strongest pillars there is music. I would say, whether it's, whether it's Thomas yourself or me, or, you know, you, we're, you, you were, we were even going to have Lon Milo Duquette on yesterday and him being such an incredible musician, uh, orator and occultist. And it's just like so many of these people, you know, either began as musicians or are currently musicians. And then, uh, you know, like you're saying, Greg, end up finding a way to, you know, these things that we all bug our friends and significant others about. We, we talk to them all the time and they sometimes say, yeah, how about, how about you go on, on the camera and start talking to other people about that? Or how about you write a book about that or something? And it's just, it's kind of this uh, social archetype that we all, you know, have, have such a similar background. And then also a love for synthesizers and stuff, of course. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something. I, you know, I dipped my toes into the music thing for a while there when I lived in New York when I was in my early 20s. And it was a pretty hardcore sort of like an industrial kind of goth scene that I was in there for, for a few years. And when I think back now, I would say about when we weren't doing music or talking about films or something, I would say a sizable amount of our, our conversations were about conspiracy theory. It was not a whacked out thing back then. It was very, it, you know, we used to talk about the, the, the Lee Harvey Oswald thing. We talk about like things like that, you know, like it, we talk about them not in, a, not in a, there was nothing, it wasn't considered a fruitcake thing. It was considered like historical what if or something like that. It was just a, a, a line, the discussion we talk about ghosts, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the girls we knew, she lived in a place in an apartment building that Blondie and Chris Stein had lived in, in lower Manhattan. And she had seen a ghost of a boy and a girl uh, at the running around the apartment building dressed in Victorian clothes. And turns out that Blondie, the whole band had seen this ghost in the set, these two ghosts, and it's still killed in a fire. And so we used to talk about this stuff all the time, nonstop, uh, the conspiracy thing. And it was not considered a freaky thing. It was not considered something that idiots did. In fact, it was quite the opposite. You were generally intelligent people having these conversations. That's right, my experience anyway. And then that X-Files TV series came along, which is a fun TV show and it's great fun to watch. It's great acting and everything. But I think that was deliberately engineered by the CIA or someone. And we do know Chris Carter was involved with the CIA. He's admitted that now to make it look like anyone interested in alternative topics was a bit of a nut job. I really do believe that that was specifically engineered in the run up of perhaps the 9-11. Now, Greg, a question I wanted to ask you, and it's happened to me a few times since I've started doing this. Over the years, was there ever a moment where you were interviewing a guest and they came up with a revelation or something or a new idea was popped into your head where you said, you went, oh my God, I never thought that's incredible. Like a moment of like, this is why I'm doing it. Has that, you know, has, has that ever happened to you? <clears throat> it has. But disappointingly, I'm not going to be able to tell you who or when. <laughs> um, 
I understand. I'm, I wasn't going to do the same either, but I, it's a remarkable feeling, isn't it? It is. It really is. It's just uh, a, you know, a step change in your life. It's just, you know, you, again, uh, the parallel I can draw is with some of the things I mentioned earlier about things that, uh, that, d- that do move, move you on in your existence, you know, like, so t- tomorrow is not going to be like today. So I mentioned 9-11 earlier on, you know, the, the day after that was not like the day before. So I've had that with guests, certainly. You, you're one of them. You know, Anthony Peak is one of them. And there's been uh, quite a few others who have just shared some insight that I've been thinking about that night, you know, falling asleep and just, you know, my, my life cannot be quite the same as it was before. And um, I, I think that's why we're here, you know, trying to, well, that's what I feel anyway, trying to unravel reality. You know, what is this thing? What is going on? And that's why I felt compelled to do this in the first place, to talk to, you know, these people whose books I was reading, um, I felt compelled to reach out to them and have a conversation with them because I, I, I needed to, you know. Yeah, yeah. What answers have you got, if any? Like, can you say, I now know this about something or I now know that about something or I now have a clear understanding of a particular thing that I didn't have before? The, the most, um, and it was something that I intuited you know, back right back in the 80s, but I, I couldn't articulate it. Um, but the most powerful insight, really, I guess I've had is best encapsulated um, in the work of my regular radio guest, Bernardo Castrop. And that is that consciousness is fundamental to reality, basically. You know, it's, it's called, ide- in terms of metaphysics, it's called idealism. And that is the thing that keeps me going. Um, I've been going through a difficult time recently, and the thing that keeps me going is this isn't all there is, yeah. you know? There, before your life began and after your life ends on this physical plane, there is not a black void of nothingness. There seems to be a fucking massive expanse of a lot more. <laughs> and we don't know what it is, you know, maybe that, that we're not meant to know, you know, this, uh, as I was talking uh, with my most recent interview with John Michael Greer, you know, this physical plane that we're on now is a place of hard limits and struggle and pain. And we're here for that reason to experience this, you know, but that's not all there is. No, I, I really totally believe that myself. That's probably been my greatest personal understanding of all the years I've been looking at all this stuff as well, that this is basically it's it's not it's not all that it seems and even things like there's a tremendous poetry to existence i find do you look at bad things that happen in your life okay at the, the time we're going through them and people say oh this will be fine you, you, you laugh laugh this one day you want to punch them or something but when it's all over and when it's all done you do see there was a poetic unfoldment that that did bring you to that point and it's quite remarkable. And then you go back and analyze as if you think to yourself, did I, did I initiate this at some, some, some subconscious level before it actually happened? So I would be willingly have this experience. Well, subconsciously willingly have this experience. Yeah, I had a, uh, a few years ago, I went for a um, hypnosis se- uh, session, a um you know, a sort of past life regression thing. And I came away from that feeling that, uh, yeah, I, that I chose to come here. You know, that's a bit of a cliche. Like for those of you who are familiar with the works of Dolores Cannon, yeah. um, uh, you know, we, we incarnated here for a reason. We're here to, whether voluntarily or not, but we're here to learn lessons, to, to process things. And, um, yeah, that's so. So that's that's my understanding, and that's my that's my take on what we're experiencing. Yeah, I, I, the way I would describe it is that you know the way you have your flesh and blood body, and you, and people seek to have psychedelic experiences through antigens or whatever. Well, I think this body that we're having and this experience we're having in the material world is our psychedelic experience. Going back from the other direction, you know, experience this kind of flesh and blood thing. I think is really a, a symbiotic 
relationship between the two, what we'll never know. I mean, it's the, really the philosophers and the mystics and the Swamis can talk about that one forever. But I've no doubt about this either. I'm, especially now as I'm, I'm not getting any younger. I'm starting to look back on my life and it's start, and you'll probably feel the same way too. Uh, that you say like, well, that, that actually happened because it was meant to happen because if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have done this and I wouldn't have got there and I wouldn't have met this person or I wouldn't have found myself in this position. And I can honestly say that some of the, the things that have happened to me that have been very bad have actually resulted in things that were incredible as a result of it. It's the strangest thing. It's almost like a recoil, you know, when you pull a bow and an arrow and it swings back. It was almost like that. It was like, the, you know, it, 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 but I, th- I do think there's a self, a self analysis involved. If you sit there saying, oh, my, the, the world is crap, everything is shy, my life is shit, it never gets better. But if you actually, I mean, I'm a, a firm believer in the whole Jungian and Joseph Campbell thing of the hero's journey, that if you put yourself into a kind of an archetypal mythological view of your own existence, my God, the, reward, the rewards come to you, regardless of the, the level of shit you get. I really yeah, like what for- you both said there, uh, uh, just real quick, that, that it's something that, that can't necessarily be known objectively, but the pursuit of looking in that direction is really what matters. You know, there's a lot of people out there who claim to have all the answers about things, but it's it's those of us who, who are continuously looking into that otherness uh, that exists there outside of the, the physical reality and looking for some sort of answer and being on that path really seems to be what matters most. So in the end, you know, we, we might not know all the answers to what happened with 9-11 or with COVID, but, you know, or, or anything like that, but it's the pursuit of that that brings about some real fulfillment in life. Yeah, f- from a word to another word and from a deed to another deed, you know, it's that everything's a chain of causality. And you're, you're right, Thomas, I'm let you talk about things that have happened to you in the past that you can you view as negative, but uh, that w- brings you to where you are now, and that that's really 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 important. And I've always I didn't maybe have that in mind um, that earlier in life, you know. But you learn this, you know. You see how one thing that cannot happen without the other. Um, now that might sound a bit uh, nebulous, but that's the best way I can put it. And I do believe with this thing, with the, the, the Rona and the lockdown and all the bullshit that's going on now, I really do believe that this is the test that we've all been manifested and brought together for. I really honestly do believe that. Uh, and it's like, and I know we're going to get through it. I, that's, I know it may sound naive, but I can remember like even Joseph, Joe, Joseph Campbell was a middle distance runner when he was in college in university. I think he, was, he did a 1500 meters or something. But he, used to, he said that he knew he was going to win a race before it would happen. Before the starting pistol went off, he knew the race was there was he was he was going to win it or come second or third. He just knew it. And I remember that the Italian soccer player Roberto Baggio, who was also a Buddhist back in the 90, early 1990s, he said the same that he could always tell what the game was going to win or lose before they even went to the stadium. And I think I I think if you if you put yourself enough into this, into uh, this kind of process of consciously referring to yourself and using things like the tarot and dream journals or whatever, you do actually develop a sense of where this thing is going. And I do honestly believe that we're, we've been called to this moment in time, even this show, putting the show together this time. And a lot of us are going through difficult things in our lives right now. And, but there's a, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think we were going to win, you know, and that's when I say win, I, I mean, a, positive outcome i really do believe that and i am I'm, I'm not just saying that because you know i'm trying to build people's emotions up but i really do believe that there's a, a phenomenal event happening here that is seismic in terms of human consciousness and humanity is splitting in two and there's a transhumanist world for the the normies who want that but i do believe that there's another kind of world possible and and, and we will we will see the fruits of our knowledge into things like the quantum world that we've gotten from Anthony Peake and all the other people you've mentioned. I really, you know, right back to Michael Tom's Tobus, the holographic universe. I mean, we all found these books at the same time. I really do believe that that was almost like boot camp and it was meant to happen when it did. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, it, it's powerful insights. I mean, Michael Talbot's book, I didn't discover at the time, but I discovered it, I think, when it was meant to happen. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that, that was like a precursor for where we find ourselves now. And um, yeah, for anybody who hasn't read it, actually, M Michael Talbot died way too young, didn't he really? Yeah. Um, it, it'd be, it would have been astonishing to imagine what he might have gone on. Um, because there's, there's such powerful insights in that book of his, the, um, you know, the holographic universe. Um, be amazing to see what he would have um, contributed if he'd, if he'd lived longer. Well, he was like someone who went into the Max, the Max Planck Institute and wrote a layman's version of it. I suppose it's the same way I did a puzzling people. I looked through the, the AMA and studied serial killers and criminology for years and then wrote a, a layman's person on what the hell to deal with psychopaths. He did the same thing with the quantum thing. I think very much so he did that. And uh, yeah, it was weird how he died, he died young, but w what, a, what a legacy he left. I mean, because everyone like from that and he peaked to David Icke and even myself and yourself, always references work of that book, you know, in particular. Yeah, yeah, because there's clearly, you know, there's clearly something else going on here, you know, <laughs> as, as, as we've mentioned several times that we're trying to grasp. Um, with regards to uh, the incarnating at this time or, you know, the, the nature of world events at the moment and what they mean and why we're going through it, um, I mean, I was what's been happening in the news recently uh, with the res pandemic response in Australia and New Zealand. I mentioned those countries in particular because there, I uh, many years ago, I had an Australian girlfriend and spent quite a lot of time in that country. And uh, a year or so ago, I spent quite a lot of time in New Zealand. And these were two places that I instantly warmed to, you know, I just thought these wonderful countries, you know, with, uh, uh, I could see myself living in either of these places so easily, you know, be, it would just be particularly New Zealand because it has an oceanic climate, which is the same as uh, the British Isles, you know, so, <laughs> you know, rain and wind and stuff that we're all familiar with. Um, but it's just so beautiful. And I don't recognize those places now. At this current time, I, I really, really don't, and, and the, I don't recognise the spirit of the people. I, I, they're they're emblematic of the the this weird thing that's going on at the minute with us, as John Waters referred to, a head cold. <laughs> you know, uh, they're emblematic of what's going on and what's going wrong and what we're trying to grasp. Yeah, I, I don't recognise Ireland anymore either. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I don't recognize the people around here or anything anymore. Uh, you know, obviously a huge black magic hex has been put upon the human race by these controllers and people in charge. But uh, I, I, again, it's, 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 a, it's a disturbing thing to see. I mean, I always, I've never been to Australia. I've got a sister who lives out there. But I, I always look to Australia as kind of a place of independence, you know, a land of opportunity, a land of, hey, screw you, you know. And yet the way they see, they see them cowering at the feet of awful bureaucrats like that idiot running Victoria is, is quite amazing to me. Yeah, it's, it's staggering. I, 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 I can't imagine what it's like. When I read the stories um, about you know, people being pepper sprayed by police and shot with rubber bullets in, in Melbourne, you know, the first place I went to when I went to Australia, just a wonderful city, just like... So, just everything about it was amazing. And I, I, it's, it's unimaginable. It's like something, you know, it, it really is the dystopian nightmares that I read about um, in, in fiction in the 1980s, you know, 1984 and Brave New World and all the rest of it, um, just on, on steroids. It's like, but I'm still, as I, as I kind of hinted at a few moments ago, I'm still telling myself that there's a reason for this and that, we're, we're here in this time with these events for a purpose and we just need to hold a line. Yeah. That's how I feel as well. It, 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 you can't have anything that catastrophic or seismic without it not having a, a meaning. You know, you just can't. It's, it's too, it's, it, the profundity is too enormous. I mean, I, I, see, I see fellas around here that I talk to are hard men 
that I mean, like the guys down the local pub, and they're wearing a little like knitted, knitted mask with a little pansy design on it, you know. And they're they're looking around in terror that someone's going to infect them with a a, cold, a head cold. But uh, I mean, I've spoken this like yourself to people like John Waters and stuff. I don't want to go too deep into it, but it is important. It's like the alien, the alien abduction thing, like in the in terms of like say body invasion of the body snatchers it's barely a metaphor for me at this point it, it it may not be what's happening but it's 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 just as it's just as plausible as a virus making everyone scared now i've had a conversation in the last few days and the person concerned when when she hears this she'll know what i'm talking about who has had a big family break uh because um She's due to visit family, have family visit, and they will not do that because she has not had uh, the needle craft. And I have seen in my life too, relationships break down because of this and go away because of this, but something else is happening. There is no question about it. I don't know what it is, but something else is happening. And I am sorry. I am sorry on behalf of myself, I'm sorry for the, the 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 broken relationships and the heartbreak. But something else is going on here. We're, and we, I, for one, and you guys are the same. I cannot just let this go. No. I cannot just say that there, there's there's a virus. There, there obviously is. People are getting sick. But I cannot just say that is it and just put my head down and keep my mouth shut. I cannot do it. Yeah. The, trans- the transformation, like before you, sorry, Jason, just want to say this quickly. A woman I used to work with, she was one of the English crusty hippies that came to Ireland during the Thatcher years. You know, they, they went on the road when Thatcher was in power and they, loads of them ended up in Ireland living, on, living in caravans and stuff. And she's been here ever since. She, is the, she was the stereotypical hippie, an anti-vaxxer, and when, when I wasn't, and all this kind of thing, natural medicine, Hedge witch, you name the whole thing, right? Today, she shared a picture on Facebook of a chandelier made by a nurse in America that was built of huge syringes of Pfizer injections. So she'd saved all the empty syringes and made a chandelier and called it the the light of hope. And this woman who I know, who was like years, like the stereotypical outsider, is when, you know, started out against Thatcher back in the 80s and all this stuff, has well, posted that as if it was most be- it's a, isn't this beautiful and has fallen, com- has, has fallen completely under this, the hex and the spell to the point now where she, anyone who questions anything, including me, who used to be her friend, is a far-right extremist and stuff like that for not wanting to get this thing inside me. It's, uh, yes, I, I can't deal with it. I can't deal with the Well, I can deal with it. I'm dealing with it somehow, but I can't get my head around the transformation in personalities. I, this is what this is what disturbs me the most. It's like there's people I've known for years, and I want to say, "Where the fuck did you go? Where are you now? Who are you? What are you?" It's just like the Donald Sutherland film Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It really is. Sorry, Jason. Yeah. Oh no, no. I was just, same thing. Just caveat off of that. It it really is like yes, there's the head cold and. If you want to say there's a virus, the virus is some sort of mental, spiritual virus, like Thomas was saying, that it's a hex, that it really is changing the fundamental operating system of what it, how we define being human. And I like, I like Cliff High's latest video that he just put out on BitChute about this. He calls it the bug. And he does a really cool linguistic breakdown of it. But uh, off of that, it, it is as if the people who have been needle crafted, either just with the one J and J one or the other ones that take multiple ones, it's like, yeah, they've turned into entirely different people and marriages have been ended over it, mine to be included. And uh, that it's just, you know, it's hard to recognize the world that we even live in anymore. I went and got coffee before the show this morning and nearly got kicked out of Starbucks for not having a, a, a face diaper on. And it's just, you know, the, the world we live in now has, has been turned upside down. And it is if the minds and the uh, consciousness of humankind as a whole has been sectioned off and they're still part of like the organic original way of doing things. And then there's this other psycho spiritual virus that is, is trying to consume 
all sentient life on the planet or all, all thinking life on the planet, any life that has a complex vagus nervous system capable of having more than just a hive mind experience is what it seems like. It's, it's as if whatever this is, is trying to just take out the individuality of what it means to be a human being and turn people into a collective, like a collective hive mind, almost like the Borg from Star Trek, where it's just, you know, group think, uh, you know, no individual thought anymore. Uh, you know, people will call it communism, but I think communism is just another uh, symptom of this greater, uh, this greater mental spiritual virus. It's probably existed for a long time, but now it's just like Thomas was saying, invasion of the body snatchers. It's like we may have seen scouts and um, uh, forward, you know, forward operating troops as sleepers for the last couple of centuries, but now it's like the stormtroopers and the, you know, the tip of the spear of the invasion is beginning. And, you know, it's coming through in waves now, even though there's not fucking UFOs coming out of the sky or anything. It's like they're slipping between dimensions, you know, uh, that we can't necessarily see it. You know, these these entities out there, but it's as if some of the, I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's as if sometimes there are certain people out there that have been switched out. It's like the same body walking around, but there's something else operating that body. And whether that's the operating system that's been installed or who knows what is if, if it's an actual extra dimensional life form some sort of entity there's just there's something else taking over i'm totally open to all that i really am and i never thought i ever would be in fact i would have been the kind of guy who would like read about david Icahn as a reptilians and said you know eh, nah, nah nah no way but now i tell you now I, I i'm not so much now you know i'm not saying it is that or anything but i'm a lot more open-minded to that kind of thing about like a, a another species you know, behind it. Now, I don't want to end on an, a, a very negative note, but I will say this, like when you hear me talk about a parallel society and a parallel culture, what I call the tribe, and it's just a name for people who say, who say see through this mirage. I really do believe that it's a force. I'm seeing it all the time. Every weekend I meet with people from all over Ireland who are now totally, you know, the point, it's like this, uh, Greg, and Jason, there's a point when you're in a marriage, a relationship, a friendship, or a job where you say, it's never going to fucking work, okay? I have to go. You know, I now feel that way to the bulk of the human race. And you know what? It doesn't bother me because I know we can create a parallel society within this one where it'll be a hell of a lot better than what the globalists are offering. How do you feel about that, Greg? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The question is um, whether uh, we can do that within this kind of like bubble bubble of reality that, that we are in, because if you're seen to be doing something, you know, uh, different, then that indicates to others that there is an alternative. So you cannot be allowed to be seen to be doing this, if yeah. you see what I mean. So it's not so much that a parallel society, parallel reality would be a problem for, you know, the fat controllers as such, but if we're visible, that's a problem, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's where I see the, the challenges going forward. Yeah, that's why I've said the best way to do it would be a collective of consciousness and associations. I don't want any formal agreements or any kind of like, you know, the people's party of the, the breakaway non-vaxxers or any of this crap. I don't want any of that. I want the, my attitude is like, you know, get, find, find the others, as Terence McKenna said. And, you know, I have a friend here in Ireland who says, well, the solutions will manifest themselves in time. Yeah, I believe that. I'm down with that. I think that can happen. I just think now we're in a, a very dark period, but we will get out of it. And it'll be because of like people like us in dialogues like this. I really do believe that. And because of legalized freedom. Now, and that's, it, 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 we, we'll, run the, we'll run the text underneath the whole screen later on. It's legalized with an S, the UK way, not legalized with a Z or a Z, the American way, freedom. Well, actually, I, 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 I own both those domains, so you can oh. spell it either way. I anticipated this confusion early on. I thought, I'm just going to buy them both. <laughs> good idea, good idea. So uh, anything else you want to say, Jason, before we wrap up? The Greg? Well, as Thomas, like you're saying, it's, it's as if we're going through a boot camp right now uh, for training. And I'm glad to have drill instructors and officers like, uh, like yourself, Thomas, and like you, Greg. There's some really great mentors here. And I, I've just been uh, real happy to be here on the show with both of you today. 
And Greg, anything you want to wrap up? Anything you want to tell us about? If you have any other plans beyond legalized freedom or anything like that? Uh, not as such at the minute. I'm, I've turned my focus um, ever more to that actually. So, yes. and I'm um, look, looking at uh, spending more time rather than less um, on legalizedfreedom.com. But as you say, that the, the links for uh, the site will be. Uh, below for people who want to check it out but um no we're on a as i said before we're, we've incarnated here for a reason and uh if things get sticky and difficult that's telling us something um more profound not less uh we don't it, it, this life isn't about being happy and having stuff um but that's what we're told but it's not we're here to learn something and uh boy are we doing that at the minute Yep. And, uh, you know, the old adage, knowledge is power. It's true. I mean, it really is true. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Uh, I want to thank uh, Greg Moffat for coming on the show. We'll have you on again, we will. And Jason for there and over in the US and the rest of you for tuning in. Like, knowledge is power. And if you go over to legalizefreedom.com and subscribe to the, uh, the, the absolute massive archive of interviews there, and this is the kind of thing that's pre preparing us. You, you, every little bit of, every seed you can absorb from someone else's mind re regarding how we'll survive this thing is a seed that can actually save your life. So I'm a very big believer in that. And it's, it's an absolute, what's it, like, what was it, 40 euros a year or something? It's really inexpensive for like a massive amount of stuff. So uh, get over there wherever you live and subscribe to that and, you know, get involved, get, get listening, get knowledge, get empowered. And uh, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, everybody at home. And we'll see you all the next Beyond Room 313 Symposium. <laughs>